We're going to start off in Matthew chapter 13 tonight. So we uh, finished up the book of John two weeks ago, and I want to start on something new. And what I want to uh, do, this is something I've personally been wanting to study for a while. I want to do a series of messages on the mysteries of the Bible. There are specific mysteries mentioned in the Bible. According to the dispensationalists, there are seven mysteries. Okay, Now, uh, I don't trust the dispensationalists on anything, uh, even their ability to count. Okay, but and, and the dispensationalists, they always try to do seven of everything. They believe there are seven raptures. I don't know if you all heard about that. They believe seven raptures. And so the way they work that, because they've got to have seven of everything, they count Enoch and Elijah and then... I think they even count Phillips where he kind of vanishes from one place, goes to another. I think they count Jesus' ascension and then um, the pre-trib rapture, a mid-trib rapture and a post-trib rapture or something like that. Yeah, it, it, it's, it gets real goofy, but um, I don't know for sure what the number is yet. I plan on by the end of this uh, having, having a number na- nailed down. But one of the things is I'm kind of early on in studying this. Some of these mysteries, they kind of, they kind of go together. And, and so, um, you know, we'll, we'll see how many there are. The there might be seven. You know, they, they might have got lucky and got it right. But I don't trust their ability to count. Uh, they, they think there's three Gospels when there's only one. Uh, you know, and so uh, they think there's seven raptures. You know, so you can understand why I'm skeptical of that. But I want to figure it out for myself. And so anyway, we're going to start with a mystery of the kingdom of heaven. In Matthew chapter 13, verse 11 is the first verse we're going to read on it. But before we read the scripture, you know, the the mystery of the kingdom of heaven, okay, the Jews, they were looking for a kingdom. They were looking for a Messiah. But we know they missed the boat, didn't they? They missed the boat because there were certain mysteries about the kingdom that they didn't understand. Now understand, they had the Old Testament scriptures, but they, but at the same, they, they did not understand certain things that we understand today because we have the New Testament. And something one of the pastors said at the conference this week that I thought was interesting, I thought was really good, it was Pastor Jason Robinson. He was doing an overview of the book of Daniel. And Daniel causes a lot of confusion on end times in the pre-trib world because of the fact that they will read Daniel and they will try to interpret the New Testament from the book of Daniel, which the Bible says is a sealed book. Where Revelation is an unsealed book. And the way he put it, he said, you know, you need to use the book of Revelation as a flashlight to shine on Daniel. Because to help, if you're going to understand Daniel, you have to use Revelation to kind of shine on that. And you know, I say it's the same thing too with the Old Testament. If you're going to understand the Old Testament, you need to use the flashlight of the New Testament. And a lot of people don't do that. They'll take something obscure from the Old Testament and they'll build a doctrine around it. They'll form conclusions around it that are false that do not line up with the new testament and we're going to see that um you know a lot of where people are wrong today in doctrine and on end times are because they're using the old testament without the new testament well if the jews didn't even get understand certain truths that we know to be true if from the old testament they couldn't even figure out that jesus was the messiah you know what makes us think we're going to understand you know, the New Testament better by the Old Testament. You know, we need to use the New Testament first to to shine a light on the Old Testament to help us understand that. And that's a very important thing, but they didn't, they they missed it. You know, for the most part, the Jews rejected the Messiah. They lost the kingdom of heaven. And And it was because there was mysteries about it and they didn't get it. And so in Matthew chapter 13, verse 11, He says, he answered and said unto them, because it is given to you to know the mysteries of the kingdom of heaven, but to them it is not given. Okay. So this is Jesus talking to the disciples. They're wondering why Jesus is talking to them in parables. Jesus had just given them the parable of the sower and they didn't get it. The Pharisees, they didn't get it. And so the disciples are like, why are you speaking unto them in parables? And Jesus says, because it's not for them to know the mysteries of the kingdom. Now, why were they not allowed to know? Why was it not for them to know the mysteries of the kingdom of heaven? Anybody? Was it because they were Jews? Was Jesus an anti-Semite? All right, no. It was because they didn't have any faith. It's because they wouldn't believe on Christ. And if they weren't going to believe on him, they weren't going to know certain things. Why? And one thing we learn later in the New Testament, you know, the natural man cannot receive the things of God. Because they're, you know, the natural man 
uh, you know, the, or the things of God, they're spiritual. You know, neither can he know them. They are spiritually discerned. And so the mysteries of the kingdom of heaven, these are spiritual things that a natural man cannot understand. And these Pharisees, they were not saved. So Jesus wasn't going to allow them to know these things until they were willing to get saved. It was just, it was not for them. Something are for saved people to know, not lost people. And the mysteries of the kingdom of heaven are one of those. Okay. And so first thing I want to tell you about the kingdom of heaven, about this, uh, this kingdom of heaven that we're going to be talking about tonight is first off the kingdom of heaven and kingdom of God are the same thing. Okay. There is no doubt they are the same thing. Yet many people they say they're different, that the kingdom of heaven and the kingdom of God are different. And I've talked before in messages about how foolish that is. I've used scriptures to prove that, that that's false. But let me just show you a few here. In Matthew 13, 11, we see unto you, it is given to know the mysteries of the kingdom of heaven, but to them it is not given. Jesus tells us right after the parable of the sower. And so we know these next verses are parallel passages. In Mark 4, 11, right after he gives the parable of the sower, he said unto he said unto them, unto you it is given to know the mystery of the kingdom of God, but unto them that are without, all these things are done in parables. So right there, that proves the kingdom of heaven and the kingdom of God are the same thing. It proves it. It's the exact same story. One account says kingdom of heaven. Another account says the kingdom of God. Luke eight ten, And he said unto you it is given to know the mysteries of the kingdom of God, but to others in parables that seeing they might not see and hearing they might not understand. So clearly... The exact same thing, kingdom of heaven and kingdom of God. And there's other examples like that that we could give. But all of these verses, they were after the parable of the sower. And Matthew is the only gospel that uses the term kingdom of heaven. You won't see kingdom of heaven mentioned in Mark, Luke, or John. They always say kingdom of God. And in the book of Matthew, it uses both. It'll say kingdom of heaven. Sometimes it'll say the kingdom of God. And you know, what is a kingdom? You know, it's the, you know, it's the king's dominion. Well, what is the king's dominion usually? It's, well, it's a land. It's a place. Okay. You know, Kim Jong Un, I get, you know, he's the king of North Korea or whatever. I don't know if that, if his official title is king, but you know, he, that's his kingdom, you know, of North Korea, the North Koreans are a part of his, of his kingdom. So it's the king, you know, if you say the kingdom of North Korea or the kingdom of Kim Jong-un, same thing. And the kingdom of God, kingdom of heaven are the same thing. And so don't let anybody tell you otherwise that that's just foolish. All right. So this kingdom of heaven, some of this stuff's pretty simple, but I want to show you, Jesus said, it's a mystery. He said unto you, it is given to know the mysteries of the kingdom of of heaven. What is, what is the mystery about the kingdom of heaven? What is it we're supposed to understand? Well, first off, this part here is real simple, but it's important to get this. What do you have to do to enter the kingdom of heaven? Okay. Cause obviously we want to be a part of that. We want to get into the kingdom of heaven. And interestingly enough, I was listening to Sam get preach one time and you know, he said, you know, you can't lose your salvation, but he does believe you can lose the kingdom. And he was showing how, you know, the kingdom, I, I don't know if, he, and honestly, when he talks about the kingdom, I don't know what he's talking about. I don't know if he's talking about the millennial kingdom, but he takes verses, I, th I believe from Matthew 25, where it looks like people are losing the kingdom. And, you know, well, we know we can't be losing your salvation. So you must be able to lose the kingdom is what it's talking about. And he applies that to us. Now I will say, I do believe it's possible for some to lose the kingdom because I believe the Jews lost the kingdom. The kingdom of heaven was taken from them and given to another nation. Okay. But at the same time, once we get the kingdom, we get it by salvation, don't we? And we can never lose it. Okay. So you cannot lose your salvation and you cannot lose the kingdom of heaven. All right. And I, I probably got ahead of myself a little bit there, but look what it says in Matthew chapter 19, verse 24. Okay, so what do you have to do to enter the kingdom? Well, he said, again, I say unto you, it is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter into the kingdom of God. Okay, it's hard to get into the kingdom of God for a rich man. It's easier to, for a camel to go through the eye of a needle. And there, listen, there's a reason people want to separate the kingdom of God or the kingdom of heaven from salvation. There is a very good reason for that or a very evil reason for that, I guess you could say. 
But there, there's a reason, you know, it can't be that simple that that's just talking about salvation, but actually it is. Okay. The way you enter the kingdom of heaven is through salvation. You know, Matthew 21, 31, whither them twain did the will of his father. They say unto him, the first Jesus saith unto them, verily I say unto you that the publicans and harlots go into the kingdom of God before you. Why did Jesus say the publicans and harlots would go into the kingdom before the Pharisees? Well, the Pharisees, what were they trusting in? They were trusting in their works, weren't they? They thought their goodness was going to get them into heaven. They thought because they were the children of Abraham, they were going to go into heaven. But there was a group of people, some wicked people, some publicans and some harlots who had faith and they believed on Christ. And Jesus said, they're going into the kingdom before you. Because it just so happens the way you get into the kingdom is by faith in Jesus Christ, interestingly enough. Same way you get salvation. Matthew 21, 43, therefore I say I unto you, the kingdom of God shall be taken from you and given to a nation, bringing forth the fruits thereof. He's talking to the Jews there saying the kingdom is going to be taken from you, given to another nation. That's where we get replacement theology from. And what's he talking about here? Well, the physical seed are the ones who had the kingdom, but they lost it, didn't they? Well, why didn't they lose it? Why is it that the people who are seeking after righteousness didn't find it? Well, the Bible says because they sought it by the works of the law and not by faith. And they lost it. And so God has concluded them all in unrighteousness. The natural branches were broken off. Okay? But they can be grafted back in. But how do they get grafted back in? Is it when Jesus Christ returns and all Israel saved, as they say? Or is it by when they receive Jesus Christ by faith? It's when they get saved exactly the same way we do. Okay? So understand, you and I, we never had the kingdom, did we? The kingdom was never, it, it was never ours. And so once we got the kingdom by faith in Jesus Christ, we can never lose that. Okay? But the physical seed, okay, those who are only of the flesh, not only did they lose the kingdom, but none who are of the flesh ever got the kingdom or ever will get the kingdom. Only those who are of faith, guys like Abraham and Isaac and Jacob. And so Mark chapter 10, verse 14 says, but when Jesus saw it, he was much displeased and said to them, suffer the little children to come unto me and forbid them not for of such is the kingdom of God. Verily I say unto you, whosoever shall not receive the kingdom of God as a little child, he shall not enter therein. Now what's interesting about all these verses I'm using, all these verses that I'm using, mainstream Baptists have always used these and applied them to salvation, haven't they? Not even realizing that these rucktards that are out there like Sam Gipp are using them and saying the kingdom of God is something different. That's what they're teaching and teaching that you can lose the kingdom. Okay. But listen, these are about salvation and it calls it the kingdom of God. And we're not, it's like, they don't want us hearing that. They don't want us saying that because there is, there, there's a reason for it. It's it going to destroy some of their pet doctrines. If we realize exactly what the kingdom of heaven is and exactly what the kingdom of God is, it destroys some of their pet arguments. Okay. But we see you have to become as a little child. And interestingly enough, how do you come as a little child? Well, it's talking about by faith, having that childlike faith. Okay. Also in verse 15, it's notice what it says. Whosoever shall not receive the kingdom of God. Well, what does that sound like? It sounds like we just receive it. Well, how do we receive it? Like a little child, we receive it by asking. We receive it by faith. We don't earn it, do you? Listen, if you can lose the kingdom of heaven, that means you can earn the kingdom of heaven. So we see that the king, you know, gaining the kingdom of God, earning the kingdom of God, it is the same thing. But you rarely hear that terminology used in Baptist churches. There, okay. The Rugmanites are trying to take us away from that and they're succeeding in the mainstream Baptist church because there's a reason that we are not supposed to say that and, and use that term, kingdom of God. It destroys some of their pet doctrines. So let's keep on going and you'll see where, uh, what it's going to do. Jesus, uh, Mark 10, 23, Jesus looked around about and saith unto his disciples, how hardly shall they that have riches enter into the kingdom of God. And the disciples were astonished at his words. But Jesus answereth again and saith unto them, children, how hard is it for them that trust in riches to enter the kingdom of God? 
Okay? If you're trusting in riches, you're not going to get it. You've got to have faith in Christ. That is the only way it can be done. And then uh, Mark chapter 12 and verse 34, when Jesus saw that he answered discreetly, he said unto him, Thou art not far from the kingdom of God. And no man after that durst ask him any questions. This guy, he, he was close. You know, he, he was almost there, but he, di he just didn't quite have that faith. He understood, uh, you know, that, well, let's go back and read that. I, I, I got to make sure I, I get this right and I'm not mixing up stories here. Mark chapter 12 and verse 34. I want you to see something in this passage. I'm not going to quote it exactly right. But um, it said, or, or in verse, let's start in verse 29. He had asked Jesus about the greatest commandments or what is the first commandment? In the verse 29, Jesus stands in the first of all commandments is hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord. And thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, with all thy soul, with all thy mind, with all thy strength. This is the first commandment. The second is like, namely this, thou shalt love thy neighbors thyself. There is none other commandment greater than these. And the scribe said unto him, well, master, thou hast said the truth for there is one God and there is none other but he and to love him with all the heart, and with all the understanding, with all the soul and with all the strength. And to love his neighbor as himself is more than all whole burnt offerings and sacrifices. He understood that loving God was better than all those sacrifices. Because you know what? Those sacrifices, they were nothing. And the blood of bulls and goats can't cleanse away sin. And, but yet at the same time, though, he wasn't quite there yet. Okay? He understood that, hey, you know, that old, you know, loving the Lord is better than all those other things. But he still didn't quite have that faith yet. So he didn't quite make it. Okay? He was close, but no cigar. And so understand that there's many people who think that, you know, it's about how good you are, you know, and they know a lot of the commandments. They're like that rich young ruler. They can talk about all the commandments that they've done. But if you are trusting in your works, okay, even if you know the Bible, even if you know the scriptures, if you're trusting in your works at all, you're not there. It's all about faith in Jesus Christ. And so the kingdom of God, the kingdom of heaven, all right, it is something that we get when we get saved. When you get saved, you enter the kingdom of God. You enter the kingdom of heaven or you receive the kingdom. And proof of that, okay, that no one would deny is John chapter three, verse three. Jesus is talking to Dick Demas. Jesus answered and said to him, verily, verily, I say unto thee, except the man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Y'all see that? Everybody knows being born again is being saved. Everyone knows that. I don't think any, I don't think there's any debate on that. If you're born again, you're saved and you're not going to see the kingdom of God unless you're born again. Verse five, Jesus answered, verily, verily, I say unto thee, except the man be born of water and of the spirit, he cannot enter into the, into the kingdom of God. Now, why is that? Well, because that which is born of the flesh is flesh. And that which is born of the spirit is spirit. Now, do you all see that there? Because what, they, what the dispensationalists are doing, they're making a huge deal about this earthly kingdom that's going to come. You know, the millennial kingdom that's for the Jews. Okay? That's they, about a physical people. They make a huge deal about that, that physical kingdom. Well, what are they doing? And we don't have time to go to all the scriptures they use, but what are they doing? They're taking scriptures from the Old Testament and they're shining the old, you know, they're, they're interpreting the New Testament by what the Old Testament teaches instead of the other way around. We got to go off what the New Testament says and shine the light of the New Testament on the Old Testament. We'll understand the Old Testament more clearly. And we see, let, we see, in the New Testament, that when it comes to this kingdom that was prophesied in the Old Testament, that flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God. So why are we making a big deal about the physical seed of Abraham? Why are we making a big deal about bloodlines? It makes no sense. I understand that, yes, that's what the Jews thought it was all about. That was what they expected. But that's because they only had the Old Testament. And what, un unfortunately, they didn't believe Christ. So they never were born again. And you know what? They lost the kingdom. And it's going to those who are of faith, the spiritual seed, because that which is born of the flesh is flesh. And Jesus said, except a man be born of water and of the spirit, he cannot enter into the kingdom of God. Only those who are born again are going to go into the kingdom of God. It's not, it's not just for physical Jews. It's not for physical Jews, period. 
It's for spiritual Jews, those who've had the circumcision of the heart. And so that's why they can't, you know, we can't be saying too much, you know, receive the kingdom of God, you know, receive the kingdom of heaven and, and apply that to salvation because they're trying to say, no, that's for the Jews. That's for the physical seed of Israel, but that, that is wrong. And what they will do is they will try to separate the gospel that Jesus preached. They'll take, he preached the gospel of the kingdom and then Paul preached the gospel of the grace of God and they were different gospels. The gospel of the kingdom was to the Jews. Jesus came and preached to the Jews. And then Paul later preached the gospel to the Gentiles. And listen, we don't have time to go to all the references, references for it, but sometimes Paul did refer to it as the gospel of the kingdom of God. You know, he said, I preach the kingdom of God to you, talking to Gentiles. So that's still a, a stupid argument that they make, you know, that it, that was something only Jesus preached. Paul preached the gospel of the kingdom of God too, but most of the time he didn't call it that. And there's a really good reason for that. And, and uh, I'll show you that in a little bit. But so the reason we see what looks like a shift in focus from the kingdom of God to faith in Jesus Christ is because after Jesus rose from the dead, it was revealed that he was what the kingdom of God was all about. Okay. It was, it, you know, what, so what changed? Well, when Jesus came to earth, he came in the name of his father, didn't he? He didn't come in his own name. He came in the name of his father. And for people to be saved, they had to believe Jesus' words, didn't they? And that's why Jesus taught the book of John. You know, if you believe most of the prophets, you'll believe me because they spoke of me. If you believe not my words, you know, you're, if, if you don't believe me, you don't believe the father. If you don't see me, you don't see the father. You know, he's trying to show them, hey, the way to the Father, you got to believe in me. I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. But they wouldn't receive his words. They would not, they would not believe him. But once again, Jesus did. He talked about the kingdom of God because he, he didn't come in his own name. He was always giving glory to God. He was always pointing things to God. But after Jesus rose from the dead, God gave him a name that was above every name. We see the focus go from the kingdom of God to Jesus Christ himself because of the fact that we learned that the kingdom of God is Jesus Christ and those who are in Christ. That is what the kingdom of heaven is. That is what the kingdom of God is. John 5, 43, Jesus said, I am come in my father's name and ye receive me not. If another shall come in his own name, him ye will receive. And we know the antichrist is going to come in his own name, but Jesus came in his father's name. So that's why Jesus wasn't going around saying, believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. He didn't say that. What did he do? You know, he often spoke in parables. He often, you know, spoke in ways hard to understand, but he was trying to get people to believe him and trust his words. And those who did got saved. Those who did got the kingdom of God. But we don't see it being called the kingdom of God as much after Jesus' resurrection because it turns out the kingdom of God is Jesus Christ. He's the name above every name. It says in Philippians 2, 5, Let this mind be in you, which is also in Christ Jesus, who being in the form of God, thought it not robber to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation and took upon him the form of a servant and was made in the likeness of man and being found in fashion as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross, wherefore God also hath highly exalted him and given him a name, which is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow of things in heaven and things in earth and things under the earth, and that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. So we see here that because Jesus humbled himself and was obedient unto death, even the death of the cross, after that, we see now the name of Jesus Christ exalted. Okay? Now understand, everyone who's ever been saved, it's been because of what Jesus Christ did on the cross. Everyone who's ever been saved. But y'all understand in the Old Testament, they would say he believed God and it was accounted unto him for righteousness. Well, who is God? It's Jesus Christ. Jesus comes along, he's preaching the kingdom of God and those who would believe his words, Jesus Christ, even though Jesus didn't say, you know, believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. He didn't, he didn't come in his own name. He came in his father's name. Those people got saved when they believed on him. They got saved because of the work that Jesus was going to do on the cross. But after the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ, we see God now exalting the name of Jesus Christ. And so that's the name we proclaim everywhere we go. It wasn't how they did it in the Old Testament. 
They didn't proclaim the name of Jesus Christ. But understand, it was what Jesus Christ did that made a way of salvation for everybody, past, present, and future. Okay, And so that's why we see what appears to be a shift in focus, but it's not a new gospel. It's the same gospel. The gospel of the kingdom, the gospel of Jesus Christ, turns out it's the same thing. The gospel of the kingdom, or the, the, you know, the kingdom of heaven, all that, it sounds kind of general, doesn't it? It doesn't sound real specific, but you know what? It gets real specific when it's the gospel of Jesus Christ. Because we know He is the only way to heaven. He, only through Jesus Christ is anyone getting into heaven. And so we see the kingdom of God is a spiritual kingdom. 1 Corinthians 15, 50, Now this I say, brethren, that flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God. Neither doth corruption inherit incorruption. Okay? So it's not about a physical people. It's about a spiritual people. It's about those who are in Christ. That's how you get into the kingdom of God or the kingdom of heaven. It's by faith in Jesus Christ. You have to be born again, a spiritual birth. Why? Because flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God. Okay, flesh and blood cannot inherit Jesus Christ. You got to be changed. You got to be transformed into a spiritual man. Okay, not a physical, not, not, so there's nothing we can do in the flesh that can make us worthy of salvation. That can make us worthy of Jesus Christ. And that's why it's foolish. These people teaching, you know, you got to turn from your sins. You got to change or whatever. That's foolish because we, we can't do good enough. That's why we call on the Lord for salvation. Lord, I can't repent of my sins. You know, and all these people that say they repented of their sins, I just want to ask, so how long has it been since you sinned? Because that's what it means to repent of your sins. You know, well, you know, you just have to be willing to turn from your sins. Well, I'm sorry, that's not going to work because most people are smart enough to know that they can't go the rest of their life without sinning. Well, I know they're not going to do it, but they've got to be willing. Well, so what are we going to do? We're going to lie to them and convince them that they can you know, listen, you can do it. You can do it. You can go your entire life and never sin again. Are you willing to do that? All right, let's try it. You know, and then five minutes after they get saved, they're going to fail. Now they're going to think, man, I lost my salvation. Nope, that's okay. Because all you had to do was just be willing. And so we did. We tricked you into being willing and to think you could do it. And, but that's all right. You know, that is so dumb. But... And you know, they'll, they'll call that the classic straw man argument, but that's exactly what it is. I don't know how else to explain it, what they're teaching. It's, it's a joke, but the kingdom of God, it's a spiritual kingdom. It's for those who are of faith. And so what is the kingdom of God? Okay. It's Jesus Christ and those who are in him. Jesus Christ is the kingdom of God. Matthew six thirty three. but seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. How do we get his righteousness? By being washed in his blood. That's how we get his righteousness. We receive his righteousness when he cleanses us from our sin. We receive his righteousness when we believe on him. It's not about our righteousness. It's about his righteousness. Matthew 12, 28, Jesus said, But if I cast out devils by the Spirit of God, then the kingdom of God is come unto you. Do you all see that? What's he saying? The kingdom of God has come unto you. He's saying, why did he say it? Because he was here. See me casting out devils? I'm doing it by the Spirit of God because the kingdom of God has come to you. I am the kingdom of God is what he is saying in a sense there. Colossians 1.25 Wherefore I am made a minister according to the dispensation of God which is given to me for you to fulfill the word of God even the mystery which hath been hid from the ages and from generations but now is made manifest to his saints to whom God would make known what is the riches of his glory of this mystery among the Gentiles, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory, whom we preach warning every man and teaching every man in all wisdom that we may present every man perfect in Christ Jesus. How are we going to present anybody perfect? Listen, if it's about what we do, nobody in this church is saved. How are we going to present you perfect in Christ Jesus? You receive him by faith. You'll be perfect in Christ Jesus. Why? Because Christ in you. Jesus Christ is in us. That is how we receive the kingdom of God. Jesus Christ was the kingdom of God. It says in, uh, well, let's look at a few confusing passages on this. Because when you understand that Jesus Christ is the kingdom of God, and those who are in Christ are the kingdom of God, it actually clears up some confusing scriptures. Look at Luke chapter 9, verse 27. 
It says, but I tell you of a truth, there be some standing here which shall not taste of death till they see the kingdom of God. And it came to pass about an eight days after these sayings, he took Peter and John and James and went up into a mountain to pray. And he prayed in the fashion of his countenance was altered and his raiment was white and glistering. And behold, there talked with him two men, which were Moses and Elias, who appeared in glory and spake of his decease, which he should accomplish at Jerusalem. But Peter and uh, they that were with him were heavy with sleep. And when they were awake, they saw his glory and the two men that stood with him. So you see right here, Jesus said there can be some standing here you know, that are going to see the kingdom of God. So what's he talking about there? Are some of them going to live till the rapture? No, that's mentioned in three Gospels, and in all of them, the very next thing it mentions is the Mount of Transfiguration. And they saw Jesus transfigured there. They saw Him transformed into His heavenly state, I guess you could say. They saw Him transformed into that. What were they seeing? They were seeing the kingdom of God. They were seeing that Jesus Christ is that kingdom. Jesus Christ in his glorified state. Okay. Let me show you a few more verses about this. This is important. But in Mark 9, verse 1, And he said unto them, Verily I say unto you, There be some of them that stand here which shall not taste of death, till they have seen the kingdom of God come with power. And after six days taketh him Peter and James and John, and leadeth them up into a high mountain apart by themselves, and he was transfigured before them, and his raiment became shining, and seeding white as snow, as no fuller on earth can white them. Okay, so he, his raiment's shining here. And right after he said that, until you see the kingdom come, some would say that's a rapture. But no, those guys didn't live. They're, they're all dead. They all died. When did they see the kingdom of God coming in power? It was when he was transfigured on the mountain. That was when they saw it. Matthew 17, verse 1. And after six days, Jesus taketh Peter and James and John, his brother, and bringeth them up into a high mountain apart, and was transfigured before them. And his face did shine as the sun, and his raiment was white as light. You all see that mentioned Jesus' face shines like the sun, okay? So right here, I submit to you that when Jesus Christ was on earth, the kingdom of heaven was on earth, okay? The kingdom of God was on earth, okay? Um... Turn over, well, look at John, or not John, Matthew chapter 3, verse 1. It says, In those days came John the Baptist preaching in the wilderness of Judea, saying, Repent ye, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Okay? The kingdom of heaven is at hand. What does that mean? I mean, it's, it's just about here. For this is he that was spoken by the prophet Isaiah, the voice of one crying in the wilderness, Prepare ye the way of the Lord, make his path straight. You all see, he said, The kingdom of heaven is at hand. Why did he say that? Because Jesus Christ was about to begin his ministry, wasn't he? Jesus Christ, the, at his first, this is talking about his first coming, okay? And when Jesus Christ was on earth, I hope you can get this, all right? This is where you might have to think a little bit, all right? This is something you might have to just chew on tonight and ponder a little bit, okay? The kingdom of heaven came to earth when Jesus Christ was on earth, okay? But understand it was kind of a, it was, it was still kind of a faith thing, wasn't it? Was, did, did everybody else see Jesus glowing and shining or anything like that? No, they didn't. But there were a lot of people that believed on him. And so they received the kingdom of God. When they saw him, when they believed him, they received the kingdom of God. Just like those who believed Jesus, they saw the father, spiritually speaking. Okay. Physically they didn't. All right. And so understand when Jesus but when the disciples saw him, they saw him come, the kingdom come in power and glory on the Mount of Transfiguration when he was transfigured, when he began to shine, when his face began to shine. Okay. And remember, I said that the kingdom of heaven is Jesus Christ and those who are in Christ. Okay. Now, those of us who are saved, we have the kingdom of God, but we have it spiritually speaking, don't we? Physically, we don't have it yet, do we? Just spiritually, we have it. Okay, But one of these days, physically, we will have it. And that's why we pray, thy kingdom come. Okay, Jesus, the kingdom did come one time, but it needs to come again, doesn't it? That's the call, why we call it the second coming. 
And what's going to happen at his second coming? What's going to happen when Jesus Christ returns and every eye sees him? Those of us who are saved, when we see him, we will be like him, for we shall see him as he is. And interestingly enough, in Daniel chapter 12, when it's clearly talking about the rapture, in verse 3, it says, And they that shall be wise shall shine as the brightness of the firmament. You all see that? That's kind of like what happened with Jesus Christ on the Mount of Transfiguration. He began to shine, didn't he? Same thing that's going to happen to us. So when the kingdom of God returns, when the kingdom of heaven returns, which is Jesus Christ at his second coming, guess what? We then will physically receive the kingdom of God and we will become just like Jesus Christ. We will be changed in a moment in the twinkling of an eye and we're going to be caught up to be with the Lord in the air and all of us who are up in heaven... How did we get there? We got there through Jesus Christ. We are there because we are in Christ, because we have been born again. The kingdom of God is Jesus Christ and those who are in Christ. The only way you receive the kingdom of God is to receive Jesus Christ. And the only way you can receive Jesus Christ is by grace through faith. That's it. That's all there is to it. It's that simple. It's kind of mysterious in the gospels a little bit. But when you realize that, wait, no, the kingdom of God was Jesus Christ. When you realize that it, it, it's him and then when we have Christ, you understand we have the kingdom of God and yet, or we have him spiritually speaking, but we're not physically going to get it until this body has been transformed, until it's been changed, until this corruptible puts on incorruption. Why? Because flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God. We can't, we can't physically have the kingdom. We only have it spiritually right now. But we will have it physically when our body has been transformed. So we see uh, in 1 Corinthians 15, 50, where it says flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God. Okay, that's all over the Bible. Jesus said the same thing in John chapter 3, yet people still think the kingdom of God is for physical Israel, which is just a joke. But verse 51 says, behold, I show you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed. In a moment, in a twinkling of an eye, at the last trump, for the trumpet shall sound, and the dead shall ra be raised incorruptible, and we shall be changed. For this corruptible must put on incorruption, and this mortal must put on immortality. So when this corruptible shall put on incorruption, and this mortal shall put on immortality, then shall be brought to pass the saying that is written, Death is swallowed up in victory. So we see we're going to have that transformation, and we will, not, we will not just receive the kingdom of God, we will be the kingdom of God. Because we are with Christ. You know, those who are in Christ, they are Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. Well, heirs of what? Well, heirs of God's promises that he made to Abraham. Heirs of a kingdom. Heir, all those promises. Luke chapter 21, verse 31. Notice this too, because this is where it can kind of get confusing. But once again, if you understand what the kingdom of God is, these passages get real clear. It says, so likewise, when you see these things come to pass, Know ye that the kingdom of God is nigh at hand. Well, wait a minute. I thought the kingdom of God was already at hand. John the Baptist said that, right? Well, this is a reference to the second coming. Okay? The kingdom of God, it's not at hand yet. Let no man deceive you that the day of Christ is at hand. Right? Let no man deceive you of that. That day shall not come except the falling away. Talks about the abomination of desolation. Luke 21, talking about the same thing. It mentions the abomination of desolation. And after that, we can say the kingdom of God is nigh at hand. After the Antichrist has been revealed, after the abomination of desolation, we will then say the kingdom of God is nigh at hand. Because what does that mean? Because Jesus Christ is about to return. He's about to have his second coming. So John was appropriate when he said the kingdom of God is at, or, you know, is at hand. Because Jesus Christ was on earth. Jesus Christ was just about to begin his ministry. And then sure enough, not long after he said that, he shows up on the scene, behold the Lamb of God, which takes away the sin of the earth. And so Jesus did. He had that moment where he came in power on the Mount of Transfiguration. But that was all at his first coming. He went back to heaven and we're waiting for his second coming. So the kingdom of God is not on earth physically right now, only spiritually, only Jesus Christ in our hearts. But when he physically comes back, the kingdom of, we will then receive the physical kingdom, Jesus Christ, our new glorified bodies. So right there, uh, it, you know, it's very clear. 
And there, I'm not, I'm not going to take time to read all of them, but there's more scriptures where there's uh, references to the kingdom of God coming in the future. That's because it's talking about his second coming. So physically speaking, the kingdom of God is not here right now because Jesus Christ physically is not here. Spiritually, the kingdom of God is here because spiritually Jesus Christ is here. Christ is in us. And so we do, we have the kingdom of God spiritually, but we're waiting for it physically and it will come in his second return. So these verses clearly refer to the second coming of Christ. And if verses about Jesus second coming are the kingdom of God coming, and even a dispensationalist would agree with that, I think, then don't we have to conclude that the kingdom had come at Jesus's first coming? It did come, but what did they do? The Jews rejected him. When they rejected him, they said no to Jesus. They said no to the kingdom of God and they lost it. Why? Because they weren't willing to be, they didn't, they didn't want to believe. They didn't want to have faith. They didn't want to be born again. They didn't receive the righteousness. They sought it by the works of the law. And so they were, they were broken off those natural branches. They were broken off. And the only way they're getting grabbed back in is if they will believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. And so understand you know, that, uh, you know, it's important that we understand what the kingdom of God is. And you can see why the dispensationalists are trying to separate the kingdom of God from salvation. Because if we understand that the kingdom of God is salvation, we're going to understand that the kingdom of God is Jesus Christ. We're going to understand that the kingdom of God is within us. We're going to understand that the kingdom of God is for us. For those who have been born again, for those of us who are spiritual, not for those who are of the flesh. And guess what has just happened? Zionism has just been obliterated. And they can't have that. They can't let that take place. If we understand that, if we understand that the kingdom of God is Jesus Christ, then when we read Luke 21 and see after the abomination of desolation that the kingdom of God is nigh at hand then we're going to understand that, yes, Jesus' second coming isn't until after the abomination of desolation. That, yes, 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 means exactly what it means when it says, let no man deceive you that the day of Christ is at hand. And so it, it all fits together so perfect. It makes so much sense. But people will, and they'll try to mess with you sometime when you say it's not at hand. They'll say, yeah, you know, it's, it's at hand. It's appropriate. John the Baptist, way back 2,000 years ago, said it was at hand. Well, that's because Jesus was just about to start his earthly ministry. Because Jesus Christ was on earth. He's not on earth right now. So it's not at hand. It's not until after the abomination of desolation. So you can just see, you know, when you're mixed up on, when you've got your facts all wrong, you know, when you're trying to make the Bible fit dispensationalism you're just going to have a train wreck on your hands and that's what they have and you all know spencer smith he's been here before you know he did a tweet saying the day of christ is at hand he referenced second thessalonians chapter two my wife tried to help him out and call him out show him how stupid that was so he wouldn't look foolish and he just responded with something along the lines of you know women are supposed to keep silence or something like that and well then he put a video out saying the day of christ is at hand and then somebody got a hold of it and, you know, and they put that together, showing the scripture, made him look real stupid. Of course, he took his video down saying that because, you know, it's like, you should have just listened to Cassandra. You should have just listened to her. And, uh, you know, she holds her own with these people on Twitter and stuff. She's, she's been kicking behind lately, uh, with these people, but it's not hard because, you know, when, when you have truth on your side, it's easy. You know, it, it's just a matter of, you know, how do you win these arguments? Just be right. Line up with the scriptures and you'll make them look like idiots every time. That's always their go-to. Women keep silent. Yeah, because you, you can't handle it. Uh, you, you, can't ha you, just, you can't handle the truth, as they like to say. <laughs> but it is, you know, people are, they're shooting themselves in the foot. And so in conclusion, you know, to sum all this up, the kingdom of God or of heaven is Jesus Christ and those who are in Christ. Just understand that. When you read the Gospels, yeah, you see it called that over and over again. You don't see believe on the Lord Jesus Christ as clearly, even though you have John 3.16, which is pretty clear. Okay, But you do see all those references because Jesus Christ, he didn't come in his own name. 
He didn't make a huge deal about his name. But after he humbled himself and became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross, God, the Father, made a huge deal about the name of Jesus Christ. And so we see kind of a focus, and we see the apostles, and the apostle Paul especially, making a huge deal about the name of Jesus Christ. Because, you know, what? Well, we're not going to call it the kingdom of God anymore, or the kingdom of heaven anymore. You know, it's about Jesus Christ. He's the one that they need to focus on. He's the one that they need to receive. And it was often, too, it was the Jews that they would be going and preaching to. And they had to know, hey, the kingdom of God, it is about Jesus Christ. They had to make sure they emphasized the name of Jesus so you wouldn't have a bunch of Jews saying, well, we believe in God the Father, we don't believe in Jesus. Well, Jesus taught us that that's impossible. And so we do. We focus on the name of Jesus to make sure there's no confusion. But the kingdom of heaven, it's a literal kingdom and it's even physical, okay? I, I believe there will literally be a physical kingdom on this earth, but it's only going to be inhabited by those who've been transformed physically. This flesh will not be able to enter into the kingdom of God. It, it will not, but my new body will. My body like Jesus after his resurrection, after Jesus Christ resurrected, he had real flesh and bone, remember? Remember? He said, I'm not a spirit. A spirit hath not flesh and bone. And so we will we'll have a, a physical body, but it will be a new one that the Bible refers to in 1 Corinthians 15. We might talk about this in one of the other weeks that uh, you know, it, is, it is a literal physical body that we can feel and that we can touch, but the Bible calls it a spiritual body because it's one that's without sin. It's one that's been raised by Jesus Christ. And so... Uh, you know, those who get saved in the millennium, they will be part of the kingdom then like we are today. Okay. They will be, they will be part of that kingdom spiritually, but they will still need to be resurrected after the thousand years. And you know what? I actually got straightened out on this at the prophecy conference, something I've been, you know, I wasn't positive I was right on this. And so I, I, I did some asking while I was there and I got straightened out on this, but you know, I've often, I, I've, for a while, I thought nobody gets saved after the rapture. And that was, kind of, that was kind of my opinion. I wasn't comfortable with it. I wasn't real sure. But I, I'll, I'll show you what I was missing in Revelation chapter 20. I hate admitting I'm wrong on anything. But you know what? I'm going on record. This is a problem with the mainstreamers. They can't admit they were wrong on anything. And I refuse to hit a dead end like they have. All right? I'm ready to keep on plugging forward. So here you go. All right? I'm not perfect, people. But Revelation chapter 20, verse 4. And I saw thrones and they that sat upon them and judgment was given unto them. And I saw the souls of them that were beheaded for the witness and for the word of God, which had not worshiped the beast, neither his image, neither had received his mark upon their foreheads or in their hands. And they lived and reigned with Christ a thousand years. But the rest of the dead live not again till the thousand years are finished. This is the first resurrection. Okay, it's talking about those in the first resurrection are those who were martyred for the cause of Christ, who had their heads cut off. The first resurrection, no doubt, is when the rapture takes place when the dead in Christ rise. But when it says the rest of the dead live not again, well, if you keep on reading later, it goes to the great white throne, right? And that's when the souls of are all the lost rise, correct? And so I thought all of them that were raised after the millennium were all lost. But notice what it says, and this is, this is what I missed, okay? Well, John 5, 28, says, marvel not for, at this, for the hour is coming which all that are in the graves shall hear his voice. And shall come forth they that have done good unto the resurrection of life, and they that have done evil unto the resurrection of damnation. You all see that? So that's not the rapture right there because of the fact that it says all that are in the graves are going to hear the voice. Now, do the lost rise at the rapture? No, they do not. The dead in Christ rise first. But there is going to come a time where all that are in the grave are going to hear the voice. And some are going to come unto the resurrection of damnation. So here's what I missed in Revelation chapter 20. When it says the rest of the dead lived not again until the thousand years were finished. That can't be talking about any of the lost people because what does it call them there in Revelation 20? It says, and I saw the dead small and great. Okay, so while they physically come forth, it's a resurrection unto damnation. They're not alive, they're dead. Y'all see what, see what that means? So that's where I miss it there. The rest of the dead live not again. Those who are saved 
after the rapture or during the millennium, they're going to die. They're going to receive the kingdom spiritually like we do now. But then after they are resurrected with a spiritual body, like we will in the first resurrection, then they will inherit the kingdom of God physically. And so that's where I miss that up. The rest of the dead lived not again. That's a reference to those who get saved during the tri- or not the tribulation, during the wrath of God, during the millennium, and the lost, they're still dead. The Bible still calls them dead. I saw the dead, small and great. Those ones are all cast into the lake of fire. And so anyway, I hope that clears all that up. You know, retraction, I hate those. Uh, but uh, but necessary sometimes. But understand though, the kingdom of heaven, kingdom of God, same thing. What is the kingdom of God? It's Jesus Christ and those who are is. And that, my friends, solves the mystery of the kingdom of God. Okay, these mysteries that we're going to be looking at, the not all, now some of them, but not uh, a lot of these mysteries. They're not mysteries anymore. Okay, they were mysteries, but they have been unlocked. Okay, Paul said, "I show you." A mystery, okay? They're not mysteries. Some of them are still mysteries, but some of them are not. This one is not a mystery anymore. The kingdom of God, kingdom of heaven is not a mystery. It's Jesus Christ and those who are in Christ. And so with that, let's all stand.